This is Alan Alda, and you're listening to my favorite podcast, Mouse and Weens. Hey everybody, welcome to Mouse and Weens. We have a special guest here. Well, first of all, let's introduce ourselves. I'm I'm Joelle, I'm Mouse, I'm the big sister one in San Diego hunkered down with pillows. Weens. Hi, I'm Weens. I'm up in LA in the film business, the single one. Yep. And uh, I'm stuck in your, I'm at Mouse's house right now and my face is in her son's bookcase. So <laughs> I'm kind of like halfway over here. Hi. We have a special guest here today. Why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm Moxie Labouche from the Your Brain on Facts podcast, your weekly half hour of things you never knew you never knew. She is amazing, you guys. We're so excited to collaborate with this woman. Oh, this shucks. Your Brain on Facts, uh, her brain is on facts. You should see this brain of hers. She's got a medley of topics and, oh my gosh, it was so fun scrolling through all your episodes. Like, I want to learn about all of this. So we're thank excited you, to have you. Yeah. So we, yeah, Weens, how did we set this up? Tell her what was on your mind and then how we got to this topic. Well, you had mentioned Moxie as having a fantastic podcast that's just full of facts. I absolutely love just absorbing facts. I probably don't have that same kind of amazing brain that you have because I'll take in a little bit. and <laughs> but, but I just love it. I love it, love it. I was always into Freakonomics and statisticians and TED Talks and all that. So I just, I heard your podcast. I absolutely absorbed it. I, I'd have to listen to it a couple of times to keep you know, retaining don't, the information. Don't be in any way intimidated. Let me tell you where the standard actually lies here. I may take in all of this information, but I can never find it again later because I was struck by lightning uh, nine years ago. And so some of the files are 404. So I'll get halfway through a fact and be like, wait, where did this happen? Who are we talking about? Oh, look, a squirrel. Oh, oh my God. Were you really struck by lightning? Are you kidding? Yes. Um, thankfully, it was a secondary strike. The lightning bolt hit the house. I was outside milking my goats. I used to be a goat farmer. And one of them didn't want to come out into the sky water because she was certain I could make it stop if I chose to. And I just didn't choose to. So I'm standing there with my hand on the fence when the loudest crack you ever heard sounded over my head. It sounded like it was three feet above me. A bolt of lightning had hit the house, lit it on fire, and then dissipated out through the mud to the fence that I was holding on to. And oh, uh, I couldn't move my hand for a while. And I couldn't do arithmetic in my head for about uh, three weeks. And my logic center was uh, weakened as well. Things seem to have normalized thereafter, but I've had a pretty dodgy memory ever since. But it's the best excuse for a blonde moment ever, because nobody expects anything of you after that. <laughs> oh, You've got a lifelong God. excuse. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe this. How did, maybe, did I see something online about this? But holy moly. Okay, well, first of all, goat farming. We've been talking about goat farming lately. So that's a true. And where are you located? What state is this? I'm on the East Coast. I'm in Virginia. Virginia. Okay. And I was a goat farmer and a burlesque dancer at the same time. Oh. And those schedules do not line up. Oh, my wow. God. How I did you make this. that work? <laughs> not well. <laughs> Not well, I'll tell you that. Because, you know, you, you, you do the gig and then you're all hyped up. So you go out to eat and then you roll up, roll home at like one or two in the morning and you're like, okay, do I get three and a half hours of sleep or do I try to stay up for the next three and a half hours? And whichever one you choose is wrong. And the goats do not care what you, the rest of your life looks like. They expect to be milked on time. Oh my wow. God, I love it. This There's is so amazing. many questions we need to do a part two wait i need to hear oh. about the burlesque <laughs> well let me let me drop one more little thing about it which i really need to move on from in my life uh, admittedly uh it was my distinct pleasure to produce the only george R. R. martin approved game of thrones burlesque tribute uh and we actually got to go to his theater in santa fe and play for the man himself <laughs> oh my oh god my gosh do you have yes. any of that if we could put a little clip of that on our website, we'll we'll talk about that later. That I made a doc incredible. I made a documentary of it. I'll send you the whole damn documentary. And my husband, who performs under the name Dante the Inferno, 
did a routine as George R. R. Martin in front of George R. R. Martin, which he said was the single most nerve wracking experience of his life. What did he think? Oh, he, he liked it. Mr. Martin's a very nice guy. He's just like a, a just a, a sweet, older, kind of quiet, as you would expect from someone who's written 80,000 pages of, of nerd stuff, you know? Oh and everybody God. needs to stop asking him when the book's coming out and what happens if he dies before he finishes. He's really kind of sick of hearing that. Oh, right. That was just featured in, what what TV show is that just featured in, too? Didn't they do a whole piece on him? Ugh, I'll look it up. See, my brain, too. And I haven't yeah. been struck by lightning. I can't remember anything. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Fact check. The TV show I was thinking of is called Younger, and they had an actor portray a George R.R. R. Martin type character. Hormones. I'm blaming it's it on catching. that. It's catching. It is. <laughs> oh my god. I'm tr- the the unmistakable cone of ignorance. Yes. <laughs> I'm just dragging you guys down with me. God, no, we're already there. You did nothing of the sort. You know oh, what? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. say it's quarantine brain. I blame it all on quarantine. So that that is a, that, that is a legit thing. Is it's it really? Have you read yeah, about the, that? The, well, the, when you're under constant strain for so long, it really does affect you because I had to put together a national tour, having never done that before, with a co-producer who was worth sweet Fanny Adams. Uh, and uh, oh, are, are we are we working blue? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yes. okay, good. Because my default my default setting is drunken go sailor. For it. And so this chick <laughs> is not helping me at all. She keeps saying she's going to help, and then she doesn't. And I'm trying to juggle all of these balls and. Um, was just under so much stress all the time that by the end of it, I couldn't function. I was, I also, my hair was starting to fall out. My fingernails oh. were delaminating and I thought I was getting an ulcer. But then we got to meet Mr. Martin, so it was okay. That all made it worth it. But yes, yep. sometimes uh, the co-producers are, yeah, you wish you would have done it alone. I can yes. relate to that. Ooh, I had a terrible one. He was a sociopath. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> anyway... So after the George Martin meeting, when was that, by the way? That was 2016, I think. Oh, my gosh. People are going to be so excited. To yeah, see so I do need to stop that. talking about it. I, need to, I don't, want, don't need to be that guy, you know, that, that 40-year-old guy still wearing his Letterman jacket. I need him to find something else to brag about. Like, for example, I'm about to be a published author. The Your Brain on Facts book uh, really? comes out mid-June. You're kidding. So, yay. Congratulations. How did that all come about? Well, it is all thanks to Emily Prokop from the Story Behind podcast, which is a really great show. Everyone should check out. Definitely play that one for the kids. The episodes tend to run about seven to ten minutes, and it's, you know, the origins of toothpaste or ping pong balls or whatever. It's really great. Uh, She and I shared a hotel room at a podcast conference, because, of course, anything that exists has conferences, (laughs) and... um, immediately hit it off and she put me on to her they had had a bad experience with a trivia person and they were kind of sour on it but they decided they'd give it one more shot and so far things look like they've gone well and uh yeah so about two-thirds of the contents of the book are stuff that hasn't been and will not be on the the podcast feed so they are exclusive to the papery format oh and what is the name of your book again Okay, the title is entirely too long, but it is Your Brain on Facts, Things You Didn't Know, Things You Thought You Knew, and Things You Never Knew You Never Knew. That is the full title. But you just <laughs> if you go to yourbrainonfacts.com slash book, it ports you right over to the Amazon page. Or, of course, reach out to your local bookseller safely uh, because they need your love now more than ever. Oh, yeah. Right. That is for uh, sure. Amen. Oh, congratulations on thank that. You, thank That's you. That's exciting. I know, I know. So we'll post all your links and all of all the ways that people can find that, too. After. Absolutely. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. That's so cool. So what is the process of writing a book pretty straightforward, easy, difficult? It is you... definitely complex. The yeah. The actual writing of it is, is one thing, but then you have to have it formatted the way that they're expecting, which can be very, very particular. And you get your various processes of revision. My bibliography is like 50 pages. Just, just listing all the sources. Oh, yeah. I spent an entire weekend just doing the bibliography. Like oh, 20, wow. 20 hours it took me to do the bibliography, just getting all the sources formatted correctly. And then you got your backs and forths. And, and it doesn't matter how many times everybody proofreads it, there are still typos. Oh. I don't know how they get past 17 people proofreading it. There are still typos. <laughs> Crazy. I know. I love finding them in books, too. I feel like I should be paid or something yeah wow yeah, it's, it's not imagine. it's not as good a feeling when it's your book let me tell you oh, that's true <laughs> that's awful 
Can you, so can we back it up to how did you, we found you through your podcast. So how did you come to create your, can you give us a little snippet of how you would encapsulate what it, the birth of the brain on vax. The birth. (laughs) Um, I just, I have this brain that's loaded down with ridiculous tangential knowledge and I can't stop myself from interjecting it into conversations. You know, I worked at a grocery store and the customers don't necessarily want to hear about the prehistoric ground sloth that redistributed avocado seeds. And that's why the pits are so huge. They just want me to ring up the damn avocado and let them leave, you know? So when my husband got me into listening to podcasts, um, I thought, oh, this would be a safe way to vent all this useless knowledge. The problem is writing a seven page script each week just puts more shit in my brain. Which then, yes. of course, gets scattered all around. And it ends up in a book. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so some of it did fall neatly onto the printed page, thankfully. That's great. So you've always had this kind of brain that has oh, yeah. loved to find facts. Yeah. Well, my, when I was a kid, I was a serious, serious TV addict, like Mike TV all the way. And so that was the punishment when I was acting up was to have TV taken away, except I was allowed to watch the news and educational programming. And that is probably where I developed my love for a well-crafted documentary. Ooh, that is like cool. That. That's a good idea. Now you can get some ideas for your kids, Joe. I know. Mine currently just play video games. So if we no, can don't, move that into education, that would be yeah. great. Yeah, don't don't take their electronics. Take the charging cables and just watch the hope fade from their eyes as the battery dies. <laughs> Exactly. Remotes. I have to lock them into the car and take the keys. I mean, you could also get uh, get little small padlocks and and put it through that hole that's in the ground on the plug. Oh, so they can't plug it in. That's smart. Oh, they might like spontaneously it. combust, though. Okay. Speaking of that, just because I happen to bring that up, do you have any information about spontaneously combusting? Because I'm fascinated by that. S- yeah, spontaneous human combustion is fascinating and you can spend hours debating whether or not it's real whether or not it's even possible there is the theory that um, an article of clothing catches fire begins to melt the subcutaneous fat and that the, the then the fabric then wicks the fat up like fuel but it's bizarre because nothing else in the house is destroyed and yeah there are there are a number of supposed incidents but no clear consensus one way or the other and depending on what day you ask me, you know, I'll be either for or, or anti-spontaneous yeah. human combustion. <laughs> By the way, ladies and gentlemen, this was a spontaneous question. So the fact that she just had that sitting in her brain means something right there. I'm sorry, does, 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 <laughs> does everyone okay. not just immediately <laughs> dive into spontaneous human combustion? <laughs> Is there anything that you are super, you have so... A vast array of subjects on your on your podcast. I mean, it's just incredible. So, is there anything that you are most excited about, or something that you love doing? Yeah, I mean, we, we all about? have these topics where we that we just can't resist. Like everything that comes up, we we have to get more of. I am um, I'm fascinated by in my I called my episode "Well Traveled Corpses." So these are people who, whose bodies covered more ground when they were dead than they when, when they were alive. Like Elmer McCurdy, the uh, failed train robber in the 1860s, whose body eventually made its way onto the set of The Six Million Dollar Man, where they thought he was a dummy. Uh, Ava Perone, of course, went through three other countries before she was finally buried uh, back in Argentina. Uh, Juana Pastrona, uh, who was a, a Mexican woman from, woman from rural Mexico who had hypertrichosis. She was covered with thick hair. And she also had a condition that made her gums and uh, lips very thick, which gave her a sort of simian appearance, for lack of a better word. So she ended up on the sideshow circuit, as you do back then, and was marketed as the orangutan girl, the bear woman, you know, claimed to be a half breed of humans and monkeys and all this stuff. And one of her promoters married her probably to keep her all to himself. And they had a child, but unfortunately, Juliana and the baby uh, died pretty much after childbirth. And he had them stuffed. And it just gets oh. sadder from there. So it's either that or the uh, the mating habits of spotted hyenas. Because the spotted hyena is freaking fascinating. Do you have an obsession with true crime? Are you intrigued by the mystery and the rabbit holes surrounding unsolved cases? And can you appreciate the snark and humor of an exhausted mother of two young children? Then you should click subscribe to Naptime Nancy Podcast. 
throw on some baby shark for your kids or pet or partner. Slide your headphones on and join me as I talk some true crime during nap time. Available on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, Audio Boom, and other listening apps. This is Matryoshka. Oh, <laughs> she's she has stopped by to say hi. Hi, Matryoshka. Oh, I'm recording. We're looking at the away. cutest black and white fluffy kitty. Got to yes. go see it. Oh, just, apparently, just Russian fairly. kitty. Yeah. Well, when we rescued her, uh, she was quite small herself, and it just had a litter of kittens. So I figured she was a little thing that other similar little things came out of. So she was right. named Matryoshka, Russian oh, nesting doll. Though Russian and... nesting dolls actually are Japanese, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Are see, really? bonus facts. Yeah. Bonus. Okay, it. wait. What is? <laughs> Just quickly, because I have, what is the point of the Russian nesting dolls? What, where did that come from? Do you have any idea? The, the, the original concept of them is Japanese. So the, the doll inside another doll originated in Japan. I, I'm a little spacey right now on how it jumped onto the mainland and got to Russia. I'd have to look that up okay. again with the lightning strike and the memory. Was the point, was it a kid's game? Was it just something interesting? I think it's just folk, there... I think it's just folk art. Yeah, you know, and okay. it's and it's amusing and cute. I imagine people regard it the same way we regard them today. Look at this cute little thing that someone yeah. made. Yeah, great, you know, got great. it. Oh my gosh! Okay, spotted hyenas. Spotted what hyenas. With them? Okay, spotted hyenas are a female dominant society. The females are even bigger than the males, and a male cannot rise up in the rank below even the lowest ranked female. You know, you're, a, a male cub has a little bit of rank thanks to his mom until he's grown up and then he's right back to the bottom of the queue. I like this. Female hyenas have a clitoris, which is not like a human clitoris. It is like a pseudo penis and in fact is so confusing to researchers that they have difficulty even telling males from females when they have one anesthetized. The, the, the pseudo penis wow. is that convincing. Wow. But it gets wilder. Hold on. Because that is also their birth canal. What? So they have to get a real penis inside the pseudo penis and then, two months later, give birth through it. Whoa. Can you imagine? <laughs> this sounds I thought so I had painful. it bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, ba- basically like trying to squeeze a baseball down a garden hose. Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> this is. Wow. That secret makes life for a of very the very interesting. Yeah, an interesting. Uh, marriage night what would you do oh it's it's complex to be able to to get things positioned yes. correctly uh, <laughs> i felt bad for the little you know chihuahua and the in the great dane but this sounds even more difficult <laughs> this is very yeah, confusing. definitely definitely be sympathetic to male spotted hyenas because they also they don't get very good food because they're on the bottom of the pecking order and it's just not a good scene for them Poor Interesting. Guys, and you know, I yeah. went to Africa, I went to Namibia traveling, and we were camping cool. one night, and we were with a group of about seven or eight people. I didn't realize how many hyenas kill humans. They really are... We're th- slow. Yeah. But they we're pack slow. up we, and... Woo. We, don't have, we don't have teeth. We don't have claws. Yeah. We just sort of scream and fall down. And, <laughs> yeah. And are really good and they have their. Are they smart, too? I mean, with the pack mentality, I would imagine they... They have a, I, could, a plan. I couldn't speak to their intellect relative to to other savanna animals, but I mean they they maintain and they'll take on lions and stuff. Man, they're they're oh, not to be <laughs> spotted hyenas are not to be messed with. Hey friends, we're the girls at Unpredictably Us podcast. I'm Athena, and I'm Christy. We're two friends that are running through life's unpredictable obstacles to see how well we achieve or fail those crazy moments. We know a life without some living in it won't provide a story worth telling. So grab some coffee, maybe wine, and buckle up because we're going on another adventure. You can sit with us on Wednesday. Welcome to Unpredictably As Podcast. (laughs) Okay, can I now segue into, we just listened to the coolest two episodes that you have, part one and part two on twins. And identical twins being the first, am I right on that? I don't remember anymore. Ah! <laughs> yeah, so, I love so it. One, yeah, one episode was about twins, and then I think I got into conjoined twins in the second episode. See, I can't remember what I wrote last week. That's so as, soon, as soon as I do the new episode, all the old episodes go away. But it's in your brain. That's what's great. So if you were on Jeopardy, we'll probably emerge. <laughs> yeah. So what did you like, Joe? on what was your favorite story? 
Um, I loved the the secret language. I thought that was fascinating. And you played the clip of those of those two sisters, which was just kind of spooky. I don't know. I love. Yeah. It, I, well, but- I wish I could have found better quality. That's just one of the reasons that it sounds spooky because you have children speaking weirdly and it's all grainy and slightly distorted. So it sounds creepy. It's just the best. That was all there was on YouTube. Can you give us a backstory of that? Well, those particular girls, uh, I believe those were, that was Grace and Virginia, uh, because twin language, uh, some parents of twins will, will experience this, is the twins seeming to develop their own way of communicating one to the other that seems unrelated to the language their parents are speaking. And and it's uncertain in science, you know, whether how this is coming about, is this a help to them in developing their language skills? Is letting them speak a different language a hindrance? Uh, you know, things of that nature. But um, let me find out about, I think it was Grace and Virginia. Because I remember one thing that sounded so, I'm sorry if I just cut you off. No, 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 um, it was that they, that researchers had thought that they they discovered like these twins had this language that they created together. So the scientists came and studied it and they thought yeah. if they reiterated the language back to them that they would be able to communicate. And that turned out not to be true. Right? Yeah, it turned out that um, the girls were just very poorly mimicking the German that their grandmother spoke and their grandmother uh, babysat them most of the time. So it was just gibberish. It was just full on. So it was basically German from the grandma and then English, and then English from, from, the from, the, from her parents and from their parents. They created and yeah. it. And when the scientists like uttered it back, they started just giggling and laughing. And, and apparently it was just kind of a failed experiment. Yeah. So the, the, the scientists might have thought they were responding to what was said, but they're like, ha ha, grownups talking silly. And that's about it. I wow. love it. Can we insert the clip? Is that something that you were able to find yeah, I can send. I can send it over to you. Okay. All right. Let's insert the clip here because it's, it's wild. Here we go. Oh my God, it's so freaky. Yeah, I would love to hear from people. If anyone wants to write in about uh, twin language, if any parents have experienced it, or or what else have you found, Moxie? Any other? Oh my gosh, can I? I don't want to. I'm sorry, but the one that was the craziest. I can't remember the names, but the twins who ended up they had such a sad story. Ended up going to the asylum for twelve years. That would be oh, June yeah. and Jennifer Gibbons. Yes. Oh, which is a wild ride. Can you give us a little bit of that? Yeah, that one's cool. This this is the 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 main entree. This is the the main dish of of twin stories because June and Jennifer Gibbons were born in they were born in the Caribbean and their family emigrated to Wales uh, and they're they're of African descent. Uh, Wales is a, a pretty white country. They were born in the early 1960s, so school went very badly for them to the point that their teachers allowed them to leave school five minutes ahead of everybody else so they could make it home safely. Eek. So yeah. twins already tend Jeez, to be very yeah. close because, you know, there they were womb mates. But being oh. ostracized at school made the girls even closer. And they just began to withdraw to the point where they even stopped speaking to their family for the most part. They would only speak to their younger sister. They had a few older siblings and one uh, younger sibling. And they would lock themselves in their room for days on end. The family would have to leave food outside the door. They began uh, writing these really strange, dark, twisted stories. Uh, they would play with dolls and make up tragic backstories for them, including the, the time and manner of the doll's eventual death. Um <sighs> Don't give my daughter any ideas. She has one friend, and they they've gotten into spooky dolls and things lately. And I'm like, Ooh, that, I don't that's know if I like all this. perfectly normal. That's <laughs> Good, all perfectly okay. normal. Um, I as I recommend so often to people, definitely if you're not familiar with it, check out the YouTube channel Ask a Mortician, which is run by uh, Caitlin Doty, who's a funeral director out of California, who uh, advocates for. Uh, death positivity, ha- taking back control of the end of life and post death process, as well as natural burial. And her third book is Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs? which are answers to questions children have asked about death. And the answer, by the way, is yes. Oh, absolutely. 
<laughs> wow. Oh, we, my gosh. That's we, a whole other podcast right there. Yes. Oh, my God. Okay, so with the twins, they were writing their somber stories, and then didn't they get institutionalized? Like, yeah, what happened? They became so isolated? They started then leaving the house always together. Now, I mean, and these were like, you know, very, very tight friends, but if you've ever had a girl you were tight with, you will know that you will fight viciously with that person at some point or another. I have five sisters. I see sisters. You guys know what's up. You know? <laughs> yeah. This happened. Yeah. One time I pulled out... Um, or she pulled out a piece of my skin from her fingernails that came out like a long accordion from scratching me for taking her purse. But that's another story. I'm sorry. And I think it was a pen. It was a pen for All the right. record. That's anyway, it, sorry. That's Not to worse. digress. Okay. <laughs> so, so the girls, they're teenagers now and... Uh, getting them out of the house seemed like it would be an improvement, but not so much because they started uh, drinking and smoking weed and shoplifting and setting fires. And that was what landed them in uh, the Broadmoor Asylum. Not the best place in the world, right? Yeah. This was in the 80s, you said? Yes. Yeah, so so this? This, this would have been in the, like, the mid-70s. So okay. if you have ever seen the, that expose documentary about the... Uh, the mental hospital uh, on Long Island, where the the okay. patients were all just like sitting around half dressed and unattended and whatnot. So just combine that with what you think of like Dickensian workhouse, and okay. that's Broadmoor. Okay. I so. saw a picture of it. It was old brick, kind of fenced in, ugh, very gothic yeah, and like foreboding. That. Yeah. yeah. So they were stuck in there for twelve years, and how did they get out? Who decided to release them? Well, they became friends with a uh, journalist, one of the very few people they would talk to. Because while they're in hospital, not only were they, were they not talking, they would go into seemingly catatonic states where they would be like stiff as a board and entirely unresponsive for hours or, or seemingly days on end. Um, but they did open up to this uh, London Sunday, Sunday Times reporter who had come to try to talk to them. And they became fairly close with her. And I think she may have... Uh, facilitated them leaving Broadmoor. They weren't being freed, but they were being transferred to a, a less severe institution, like sort of moving to a minimum security. But the twins confided in this reporter, and it was Marjorie Wallace, they had come to a decision. For one of them to be able to have a normal life, the other one would have to die. And they decided that it was going to be Jennifer. So they were in the van being transported to the the lesser uh, security facility, and Jennifer just collapsed and died. And her cause of death was determined to be acute myocarditis or inflammation of the heart, but she was relatively young, not in bad shape, and it just doesn't make any sense that she would suddenly drop dead, kind of lending credibility to the belief that she just willed it to happen, or maybe she and June both just willed it to happen. I remember this part of your podcast where they said there was no alcohol, no drugs, no, yeah. there was nothing, no sign of anything. Just any toxic. Cause of, any yeah, anything. cause yeah. of death, dying. Well, <laughs> basically. And so what happened to the other twin? Did she bounce back and... Yeah, uh, June led a fairly normal life. She didn't get any, any additional trouble with the law. She was uh, fairly reclusive and, you know, stayed pretty close with uh, with Marjorie Wallace, who wrote uh, the book The Silent Twins, which is kind of the definitive source uh, about their life. So I recommend everybody check that out if this story is interested in you and you want some further reading. Um, and when asked uh, if she was still writing, she said, I don't see the point in writing books now. I can communicate by talking, can I? Wow. Interesting. That's crazy. Yeah. And uh, yeah. the, the epitaph on Jennifer's headstone reads, We once were two, we two made one, we know more two, through life be one, rest in peace. Wow. Now, do you think she died of a broken heart because her sister, like they decided it was her? And you've, you hear these people well, who die shortly after the other. And, and broken heart syndrome is... A real thing, but it's, but it's because of the stress that the loss puts on your body. Uh, right. But yes, you, you can absolutely die of a broken heart. That's why you hear often about older couples 
passing pretty close to one another. Either that or if the wife goes first, the husband doesn't know how to buy groceries or where to get his medication from. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> true. <laughs> true. Yeah. Oh, my it's, gosh. Yeah. That's I love that you also had that uh, just at your fingertips, broken heart syndrome, well, an answer for that. But I wonder, <laughs> seriously, I think about it, though. If she, if they somehow made a pact that she was going to die, she was under that stress of, okay, here I go, maybe. And yeah. Maybe. So just, yeah. I think it's we'll, ah. we'll never know. I know. And then the, the psychic connection part was cool, too, where they would be in separate wings of the, <laughs> the ward in catatonic states in the exact same position. Um, even though they couldn't see each other. So they're sensing something, they're feeling something. Is there something to the, the psychic ability? I mean, are there facts that prove well, that? Well, I mean, it's, it's sort of like saying, are there facts that prove there are ghosts? It depends on who you ask, you know, because yeah. the girls seemed to have that connection where they had been, because anytime they were separated, they would go catatonic. And employees would find them, you know, in the same physical position, despite the fact they couldn't see or communicate in any way. They would, like, take turns eating. One of them would would do the eating, and the other one would go hungry, and then they would switch. And, you know, they lived very much like one person who had been split between two bodies. Right. You know, it, it's really impossible to say if they had any sort of you know, psychic communication or anything, but it's really hard not to think there was something going on. Right. Well, we, I've looked up some videos last night and there were a few other stories on YouTube and one was, um, two twins from England and one of them had gotten into a severe car accident and was in a coma. And the other one was, would, you know, lay in the same position at home as the brother in the hospital. And they, he would, you know, feel when he was, um, asphyxiating and things like that so that's something on youtube you can check out but also what was the one with the guy with the face in the back of his head oh. okay yeah what the heck? edward edward mordrake that, i slept so funky last night <laughs> edward mordrake did you uh do you watch american horror story I haven't seen okay. any no, of but we Googled I'm it as say. as we were listening to your podcast. We Googled it. We saw all these images. And just FYI, it was right before we went to bed. And yeah. that's not a good thing to do. Yes. <laughs> so but I slept like So shit. Edward Mordrake was this uh this man who supposedly had uh a conjoined twin or a, a parasitic twin, but just like part of their head on the back of his head. Which is a thing that can happen, except according to reports, it was a girl, which is not a thing that happens. <gasps> Only identical twins can be conjoined, uh, because it either happens from the two eggs, uh, fertilized eggs colliding, or one splitting. It just doesn't right. happen with, with fraternal twins. So, no, that was not a thing. <laughs> but there is... Um, a bust that looks like a, a preserved head with another face on the back. So that makes people don't think he really existed. And supposedly the face just tormented him. And it was saying things to him all the time. And, uh, you know, doctors at the time, you know, 19th century couldn't possibly remove it. And eventually he died by suicide because he just couldn't stand this little monstery voice talking to him at all hours, but he didn't exist because he's scientifically impossible. So rest assured. I love it. And someone, I think we looked it up, and it was someone who had carved the face out Yeah, he was a, like a Madame Tussauds sort of, <laughs> Madame Tussauds uh, type of model. So it really looks the part. Ugh. That would spawn a really cool fiction story. Right. Though. I love that idea. Oh, yeah. And, and you, you see that character pop up, such as when he did on, in the, uh, the uh, freak show season of American Horror Story. Ah, okay. Bring and then Harry that. Potter, right? With the... Uh, with who I forget which professor it was. Fact check. What my mom was trying to think of is Professor Quirrell from Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. When meeting Voldemort in Romania, Voldemort tried to get into Hogwarts, but he never succeeded. So he attached onto the back of Professor Quirrell's head. And that's who was under his turban the whole time. Yeah, so it's this kind yeah. of a almost a, a reference Right there. That was the only right. Harry Potter I saw was the first one. <gasps> okay, yeah. I'm, I know it's I'm an institution so in everybody else's life, but I was like, yeah, it's nice. It's fine. Yeah. It's all yeah. right. Just, just... My, my kids are deep in it right now. If I called any of them in, they'd be able to name everything about it. But... <laughs> you know, Avatar uh, The Last Airbender is on Netflix. You can you can shift them over. There we go. I like it's, that. It's only like one of the best shows made in the last 20 years. Really? really? 
All oh, right. it I is practically perfect it. in every way. The writing's amazing, the direction, the voice casting, the acting, the the world building, everything about it. Okay, it what looks- is your other favorite show? Also, beyond that, is it Game of Thrones or... Is well, it no- was until last season. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, what's funny was was the showrunners, you know, the, the, the Dave and David, were rushing Game of Thrones to get it finished because they wanted to get to be put in charge of Star Wars. However, in rushing Game of Thrones, they cocked it up so bad, they lost Star Wars. <gasps> so they ended up they ended up with with nothing. And, Never do uh, that to your fans, people. Worst idea ever. Yeah. I know. It just it was the it was the last season was so just inconsistent and it was like, did you read this before you went started filming? You I had know, heard that You George... need a continuity girl. The main author, George, had stepped away from, or they ran out of books to... Yeah, they ran out of books. So, the so they show, had to create stories themselves, and they weren't very yeah. good at it. He gave them the outline of where the story was going to go, because he, he knows where it's going to go. He just needs to actually write it and be patient with him. He's an old man on a green screen computer, and he's still only a hunt and peck typer. Oh. So it, oh that's gosh. why it takes so long. You I know. love it. After, I think, season four or five, they ran out of original material and then it's just the show writers and then season eight the wheels came off oh guys it's always so disappointing because you're there till the very end and to have yeah, a bad and, and it, it, it it taints the rest of it because like i don't even want to go back and rewatch the good seasons now because i know that i know this crap is coming you know <laughs> why do they do that That's that true. really is a problem um i know i am just so happy that you came on is there anything else that fascinates you that you want to talk about before we go there is nothing that is not fascinating (laughs) if you stop and look at it no if you stop and look at it everything is fascinating it's like you ever stop and look at something small and you just let yourself look at it long enough and then the details start to emerge and why do we say things are too small to see with the naked eye i mean you're still seeing it you just don't know that you are but just something that occurred to me the other day um (laughs) like i've challenged myself to do some episodes on things that sound like they're too simple and boring to possibly build a show around like mud like okay Mm. how am i going to make mud interesting for half an hour and the more i looked the more i found because you have the the haitian mud cookies which the poorest people of the poorest country in the western hemisphere they're the cookies are literally made of mud but they make you feel full they, they make you feel like you're not starving to death. So that's helpful. Um, you know, mud spas and uh, scammy health resorts. And it all just, just branches out from there. There's places in the South where there's a particular type of dirt called kale and clay that people traditionally eat because they think it has health benefits. And uh, supposedly pregnant women who live in that region will crave it uh, if they have a mineral deficiency. Right, this is and it pica. does have minerals. Is it called pica? Yeah, and does and and you'll find it in your cosmetics and a lot of other products, kale and clay. Hmm. Look at in fact, that. that was that was what the active ingredient in kaopectate, um, anti diarrheal medicine, because the clay binds you up. Interesting. Oh, so it was just it was a, ca- a suspension of kale and clay. No way. And then some oh. some people just like it. Some people the, their grandma ate it, their mom ate it. They I love eat it. it. It's just part of it's just part of the culture for that region. So, ladies and gentlemen, mud is interesting. <laughs> we yeah, have dis- e- every, has everything discovered everything in the world. Everything in the world is fascinating if we stop and look at it. Are you doing podcasts every week? Are you releasing them? Yeah, yeah, we- oh. weekly, weekly, approximately half hour show. It's it's so much work and all the all it the is. writing and and the research yes. and, yeah. and posting and oh, we can barely keep case, ourselves afloat. It's a lot. Best case scenario: twelve to fifteen hours. Uh, one reason is because I, I also do my own editing, and I cannot stand the little noise your mouth makes when you go. Oh, it's so gross! Just the the little the little click when you open your mouth when your tongue comes away from your gums, and I have to go through my track and dig out every last one because I it's we all have that 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 gross. sound we're we're uh, misophonic about that a sound we just cannot stand, and that's that's one of mine. That and people chewing with their mouth open. It's gross. I probably yeah. do that. I found that when I listen to my audio check, I every time I think I'm funny, I go, <laughs> "It's so gross." <laughs> and I I do the I do the tongue click, but it's really loud, just a big fat. And then uh, it sounds like a milkshake in there. And I you see it. you see it though that those are really easy to find because I used to use um, uh, tongue click as an editing technique. So you make a mistake, you do the tongue click, and then you 
do the sentence again correctly in a scripted show. Of course, it doesn't work as well in a conversational format. Um, and because the tongue click is basically just a straight vertical skinny line, you can see where the mistake was to go and, and dig it out. Yeah. So speaking of clicking your tongue, and then I think we're almost out of time, but do you know anything about echo echolocation? Well, echolocation is amazing, and there are even human beings who use it. There okay, are, what is it? Well, echolocation is the sending out of sound waves to be able to interpret the sound that returns to find things in your environment, be it uh, a bat echolocating for a moth, or in this case, a blind human being riding his bike down the street. There are pe blind people who have taught themselves to use echolocation to an amazing degree of success to be able to safely ride bikes down the street. Um, I saw in an interview, they asked the, the blind person, he has some light and shadow. Please don't ever think that blind necessarily means all black, just as deaf does not mean total silence. And not everybody in a wheelchair is paralyzed from the waist down. Thank you very much. But they asked him to identify the object next to him, which was a, a light diffuser on a pole. And he did uh, a couple of different clicks because you got the click at the very front of your mouth and then you got the click kind of in the middle. Um, and he was able, it's like there's a long skinny vertical part and then it's very wide and flat above me, which is as good a description as a sighted person would have given for the light diffuser. And he did it just with echolocation. I heard about a kid, yeah, who would be able to ride his bike uh, completely blind by doing that. So he would just click down the street and be able to make his way to school and back. And I think that's what it was. Yeah. Very good. So something becomes heightened when one... Oh, my gosh. Okay, well, no, of course no, you know about the, that. The sense doesn't actually get better. But because because you're, you, one of your inputs has been removed, you your brain can focus more uh, on the remaining inputs. Okay. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the reason we turn down the car stereo when we're looking for an address. Right. Yes. Um, that makes sense. Now I get it. Got it. <laughs> Just kidding. Ah! <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh, Moxie, how how do you do it? This is amazing. <laughs> I'm I'm learning so much. Just, I know. Just stay stay open to the new information coming in. I, I love it. that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Moxie. We will stay open. That's I a know. great place to end. And I'm going to be more open today, looking at this the thing the small things. I go. like it. There we go. So you guys find Moxie Labouche. She is on Your Brain on Facts. Um, where else can people find you? Where's Where's your best place to find you? Well, uh, one central point would be yourbrainonfacts.com, but you can always look for the show on your podcast listening app of choice, probably the program you're listening to this fine show on, as well as Facebook and Instagram. It is Your Brain on Facts. And over on Twitter, it is Brain on Facts Pod, because it was one letter too long to put the actual name of the show. <laughs> oh, Twitter. Twitter's causing problems these days. But yes, we can find you everywhere. You're wonderful. Thank you so much for Thank sharing Thank you so your much stories. for having yeah. me for this terrific conversation. All this information, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye. You're awesome. Bye, Bye Moxie. Thank you. <laughs> so are you. <laughs> see you. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Everything from this episode is on mouseandweens.com. We'd love your feedback, so please consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. Also, please share and tell your friends because that is the best way we can grow. Follow us on all the socials at mouseandweens.com where we have been posting donation sites and causes that we believe in. Our private Facebook group has behind-the-scenes photos and our Patreon has commercial-free episodes. The full unedited episode, videos, outtake swag, and more bonus content. So we hope you become part of the family and join us there. Thank you so much for listening. Bye. And wings, mouse and wings, mouse and wings, mouse and wings and mouse and wings and mouse and wings and mouse and wings, yeah. Mouse and wings and mouse and wings and mouse and wings and mouse and wings, yeah!